welcome everyone. Um, it, it's, it's so exciting to see so many people here today for, for Development Day. This is uh, a, definitely a testament to the kind of institution that we have to see so many people come out for this opportunity. So I want to begin with a word uh, that many of you, I'm sure, have heard before. Excellence. You've heard it before because as long as I've been on this island, as long as you've been on, on this island, I'm sure since 1947 when there was first a university on this island, the goal is always in some way, shape, or form about excellence, right? And if you look at pretty much every other university out there, the goal is excellence. So the question that we face, we here at AM Corpus Christi, the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we excellent? Now, certainly by some metrics, I think that we can say absolutely, we are, we are excellent. We graduate and educate incredible students that go on to be very successful professionals. We produce quality research that is innovative, cutting edge, research that really makes a difference in our community and in many cases the world. And we have award-winning creative activity that's recognized not only locally but uh, even internationally. But those, unfortunately, are not the only metrics for excellence, right? So when you're measuring excellence for an organization, there are other metrics that you have to look at. And unfortunately, higher ed, including our university, is a bureaucracy, right? And we all know that. And when we think about it, most of us aren't really excited when we have to go work or deal with a bureaucracy. You know, if you, have to, if you know you have to go to the DMV, you don't say, yay, uh, I have a water bill issue and I've been avoiding it for two months because I just don't want to go deal with that. And you've never, as a child, none of us who have uh, ever said, you know what, I really want to be a bureaucrat. There was actually, there was actually a commercial a few years back, if any of you saw it, with little kids, and the little kids like, I want to grow up and push paper, I want to be a bureaucrat. You know, and it's funny, because that's horrible. Nobody ever, you know, thinks about that as what they want to do for, for their, their careers. And so what we have to realize is despite the fact that we have these incredible categories of excellence, categories that we are absolutely excelling in, that we still have areas that aren't excellent largely because of, of being in a bureaucracy. Now we also have to add to this to make things even more interesting is that the world has changed dramatically, we have changed, and our students have changed. So how many of you remember using a phone like this? Okay, almost everyone in the room, right? And you remember it, and, and I remember as a kid fighting with my family. This was not my family, obviously. These were crazy, but that was the best picture I could find. Fighting with my brother over was it with my turn, and you wanted to have this conversation, but you had to get off the phone because your parents were expecting a call, and you eavesdrop on each other through other lines, right? And, and I remember the greatest invention of all time, call waiting. That was the greatest revolutionary thing. Um, Today, nobody or very few people share a phone. Everybody has their own phone for the most part. And um, I don't even think my child ever heard a busy signal. She's never heard one. You go straight to voicemail or you or you uh, text. And you know, I, I even heard people's voicemail messages saying, "Don't voice, no, don't leave a message, just text me." So we have changed a great deal. And, and I'm really going to date myself with this one. Um, I actually, when we were putting this together, I pulled this uh, out, and I'm gonna, you'll, you'll hear it in a moment. But when it, when it happened, Claire did not recognize the sound, which really made me feel old. But how many of you remember this sound? The internet! Woo! <laughs> and we're all very excited, and you can still go away. And you kept waiting, and you were waiting, and you were excited. I mean, this is short, right? I'm going to be on the internet. Um, do you imagine if you were still waiting through this right now? We have no patience for this. You're right now in a room going, why don't I have any bars? I have no connection. And, and I'm you know, completely angry that I have to turn over to my phone instead of trying to use uh, an internet connection. This is how much the world has changed. And so what we have to realize is in a fast-paced society, where back in the day, we didn't like bureaucracy to begin with, with all the changes that are occurring now in, in the way things are moving, the pace and the lack of innovation that is usually associated with the bureaucracy is really no longer acceptable, right? And so we have to say to ourselves, okay, is our fate sealed? Is that it? We're a bureaucracy, we're gonna be excellent in these categories, but in these other categories, we're gonna just be slow, and Claire's telling me this came from 
uh, actually, uh, she found this picture from um, um, near my hometown. This was not my elementary school. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, you know, when we think about that, right, is that where we're going to be? We're just kind of like, okay, we'll excel in these areas and these other areas, we're just going to have to accept, accept the way we are. Well, you all know me pretty well, so you know what my answer is to that. My answer is no, absolutely not. We are not going to accept that as our fate. But what it does mean is that we are going to have to change the way that we do business. We're going to have to innovate, we're going to have to focus on problem solving, and we're going to have to focus on excellence across the board. Not just in this department or that department or this person and that person, but excellence across the, the university in every area. Now, I want to stress something, because in the past, when we talked about things like this, uh, academics in particular, but university employees in general, start to panic, okay? Don't panic. I am not saying that suddenly we're going to be all about profits, we're going to go into some business model. No, that's out. Okay, we are not doing that. Okay? We are educators. Yes, we can function in ways that the very best organizations and the very best businesses function. We can take lessons from them. But I don't even believe that the adage that the customer is always right, because sometimes the customer isn't. But I've heard many a faculty member say, um, the students are our customers, they are not always right. And that's okay. You know, there are times where we have to make decisions in the best interest of our students that don't really follow a business model, right? And that's okay. That's, that's perfectly fine. But what we can't do is allow ourselves not to talk about how the best kinds of organizations out there function. What we can't do is decide that, you know, we aren't going to be innovative and, and we aren't going to talk about those things. Because I do not believe they're mutually exclusive. You can be an outstanding educational institution and still have the way your practices run internally and your communication with students and the public be that of a highly successful organization. If we utilize those principles of innovation and technology and, and proven principles for good customer service, not just for students but with each other, if we really try to increase efficiencies and have outstanding communication, then we can be just like the very best organizations out there. And if we don't do that, then what we do is make it incredibly hard for our students to even find us. Right? They, don't, they can't even find us on the internet. They don't even know who we are. If we don't do those things, what we will do then is make it very difficult for our students to make their way through the red tape. And particularly for first generation students, it, it's difficult to navigate a university. And it's difficult for their parents who are trying to help them to navigate a university. So by not being efficient and helpful and having those kinds of practices, it's hard for them. But we also make it difficult for each other. I mean, most of the horrible things we have to deal with, we have imposed on one another. Okay, so I think it's time for us to say, how can we be more streamlined and efficient? How can we help each other as one team together? Because that is really what it's about uh, when we work at this university. And here's the really great thing. These kinds of changes in our attitude will set a and Corpus Christi apart. It will set us apart in the way we deal with our students. It will set us apart in how we, how competitive we are, and not just for students, but for y'all, right? Like every day, one of the things I have to worry about is that you're going to leave, and, and that I can find other people like you who are outstanding. So one of the things that we want to be is a place that everyone loves to work, and they're happy to be here, so that our best faculty and our best students are thriving, so that people have opportunities to develop, and so that we can recruit and attract and retain the very best staff, staff and faculty to help support you in your jobs. And like I said, excellence is, has always been part of our mission, but excellence really is a, it's a very generic term. And when you look at our mission and the areas in which we want excellence, right? We want to have excellence with an unparalleled commitment to every student's success, closing the gaps, emerging research university, a robust campus culture. Well, all of those are important and all of those are good. But the fact is, the key to those, the overarching umbrella to make all of those things happen, we don't ever talk about. And what really we need to do to make those things happen is that we have to be focused on service. Service to our students and service to each other. And that's the best service. Not just, I gave you what you need and then, okay, we're good. No, but like the really the best kind of service you can have because that's service excellence. And that's what we want to work toward. We want to make this the best place that it can be, not just for our students, certainly for our students, but also for y'all, for each other, for ourselves. So in preparing this speech, 
Um, I talk to a lot of different folks, presidents, cabinet, deans, faculty, staff, students, and I ask them, when you hear that term, service excellence, what comes to mind? And so a lot of people repeat a term. So the ones I have on here are ones I've heard from more than one person. But things like being knowledgeable is, is critical to, to service excellence. Being responsive, accountable, helpful, considerate. Being friendly, welcoming, nice. Those of you from the College of Liberal Arts, when Dean Hayes was here, he used to say, I only hire nice people. If I have a choice, why would I not? You should only hire nice people. And um, you know, I think there is something to be said by at least working toward having people that are friendly and welcoming. People who are appreciative for the work that you do and the things that you excel at. For people who follow up and follow through and close the loop. For people who are problem solvers and proactive, uh, innovative, collaborative, non-territorial, these are all things that are part of service excellence. So is clear communication. Communication that is written for the other person, not just for you. That's taking that other person into account. Being student focused, being college, colleague focused, and being university focused. Focusing on the idea that we are one university. Because the fact is, there's not a single problem, issue, concern on this campus that any of us can solve on our own. We are completely webbed together, we are a network, and we have to work together if we want to make positive changes. And I think we can all agree that each of the qualities I just read off are needed for service excellence. But to create an organizational culture, and that's what we want, is an organizational culture of service excellence, we have to be, move beyond words, right? We can't just talk about words. We actually have to move to behaviors. Making service excellence a reality and changing the culture or taking places where it already exists and amplifying it and extending it out, that really requires changes in behavior. So we must turn our words into behavior. But I've heard people say, well, what are those behaviors? What are the behaviors of service excellence? that you'll want to throw away the wrapper. 
and they place trash cans accordingly so that you so that other people don't see your trash or you're not carrying it around and they do it like adults take this many steps kids take this many steps and they and they put it out there um, based on those kinds of things because they want the ultimate experience for the folks coming there MD Anderson um, an incredible organization, of course, leading researchers in their field, and, and particularly in cancer, of course. But they also treat everyone who comes there with this concierge attitude. I mean, they're in the Anderson. They don't have to do that. But they want to take all the fear away from their patients anywhere they can make it easier. You know, you can't make, you can't take that, that anxiety over cancer away, but you can, here's hotels, here's roadmap, you know, here's, here's the best place park, here's the best way we can help you, here's where your family can stay, here's where they can get food. They take care of all of that for patients so that the patient doesn't have to worry. And of course Chick-fil-A, um, those of you, I'm talking about the one on Staples, those of you who know Justin Butos, um, he's one of our SGA, was just our SGA president, he works there, and his goal in life is to own a Chick-fil-A franchise. But if you have gone there, what is amazing is they come out with the iPad. Has anyone been there? No matter how long that line is, they come out with the iPad, they take care of you, and even if you wait a little bit, you know they're going as fast as possible, and it really, really brings down your anxiety. And these are just tiny examples, but every day these are things that you know, we encounter that are related to service excellence. Now, um, there are also examples that aren't related to service excellence that we encounter every single day. So, um, for example, this is a home improvement stores where I go in trying to find something. You too, you can't find anyone that works there. Apparently nobody works there. When you find them, they just point you to the aisle and there are 9,000 screws and you're trying to figure out which one you need and um, it is very overwhelming. So not service excellence in my opinion. Or you have um, this kind of uh, thing where you call in on the phone, right? And first you have to give all your information to the computer and then you get a person, and then you give all your information to the person who cannot help you, of course. And then you get another person who also needs all your information every single time. And uh, it is very, very frustrating. Or lines. I mentioned the Chick-fil-A, how quickly they work. Uh, we've all encountered this. This is actually, I'm sure, a fake picture because every, every register has a person. Um, that's never how that works. This is, this is a fake picture. But, um, you know, we get there, and again, if it's a long line and people are moving, it's great. But when it's a long line and you're thinking, there is a million ways we could be served better and faster. Or worse yet, the management's all up front talking to each other while there's three, four people trying to check you out. You know, very, very upsetting. Uh, bad websites are certainly something that um, all of us are frustrated when you can't find the information you need on a bad website. And I'll just say it, airlines. I don't need to say anything else. Okay, uh, we, all, we all have our own stories. But these are examples that I hope get you thinking about service excellence and your own experiences. Because you already know what these behaviors look like. You know what you don't like, you know what you do like. What this is really about is empowering you to start coming up with solutions and being innovative and working on ways to really take us to that next level so that we have a, an organizational culture of excellence. You know, this is an, an interesting yet somewhat sad fact, but given the you know, five work days of the week, we spend, if you, if you count the time you sleep, you spend 33% of your time at work. And that's assuming you work at an eight hour day. I know many of you work more than that. If you take out the time you sleep, it's 50%. 50% of your, of your days, Monday through Friday, are spent at work. So what that says to me is that we should be happy when we're at work, or we're not gonna be happy for 50% of our waking hours. Um, and we have control of that. We can create an environment in which you know, we are happy to come to work. As adults, um, or a, a study was done of, of adults, and what they found was that the thing that people are really looking for in organizations are organizations uh, in which they can make a difference, so that is very important, and also organizations that, that have a, a high level of energy, or that people can be really energized. And so the good thing about being in Corpus Christi is our job is literally to make a difference, right? That is why we exist. Now sometimes, given our position on campus, we may forget that. And that's one of the things we have to work on reminding ourselves. I don't care what job you have on campus, you're responsible for getting these students across stage. You get to celebrate and be joyful in their success. All of us make that happen together, every single one of us. So we have to remind ourselves of that. But also the other thing that people really want is that they want a place that's high energy. They want a place that's energetic, that they're enthusiastic, and they like to come there. 
And this is um, HEB, and I have done a lot of consulting for them, and I know that is one of the things they really work on, is making, you know, trying to create uh, a good energy. And although I find them to be an outstanding organization, I wanted to share with you a, a little video today of, of what I consider to be the very best example of service excellence in an organizational culture. And um, this is a place that really emphasizes the idea and the importance of having an energized work environment for people and really focuses on what it means to make a difference. And so I, as many of you know, this is an area in which I taught for many, many years. And I have looked at dozens, thousands probably of examples. And to me, this is the very best. So it, it's short, but I wanted to share a, just a brief insight into an organizational culture that reflects a lot of the things I think we should be striving for when it comes to service excellence. Pike Place Fish Market, you'll see lots of flying fish. But we saw more. Great customer service, teamwork, energy, and results. So how can you bring this kind of energy to your organization? The answers are in FISH, the most watched training video in the world. The FISH philosophy is a fresh, powerful training solution. It has four easy-to-use practices. They help you create an environment where people love to come to work. One fish flying to Deborah. One fish flying to And so fish really lights people's hearts on fire. It helps them understand, hey, it's, it's up to me. And then it shows them a very simple, predictable pathway. So we all need ways to get pumped up and get re-motivated and refocused on what it means to really work together. Checking bags. Checking bags. How you doing, sir? What you doing? Nearly every industry uses the fish philosophy to deliver amazing customer service. How's it going? Improve teamwork and trust. The more we incorporate the fish philosophy in what we do, the better job we do and the better our patients do. It has absolutely transformed the climate of our school. Our discipline problems have gone down dramatically. The businesses that I see use fish invariably end up the first choice, not just for the customers that they serve, but for people who want to work there. You build great environments where people want to come to work and where people say, that's the business that I want to do business with. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to stress, please do not throw fish. All right, or any other food or any other products of, of that sort. But can you imagine um, what the island would be like for our students and for each of us if we lived our own islander version of this fish philosophy? Obviously, it would be very different. We don't typically yell at people and, you know, and, and those sorts of things. I hope. Uh, maybe for us. But not just let's not do that. But if we really focused on having an organizational culture that, that was about <laughs> having high energy, that was about making a difference, and it was about service excellence, because they all go hand in hand. Let's look at play, for example. And again, let me stress, please don't throw things. Um, but the idea of play is unique, as they stated in the video, for every organization. Obviously, whatever you do has to be appropriate, it has to be professional, it has to be respectful. But the idea of having fun at work and having a way to really have joy in your work is, is about being energized in what you do. Play is not so much an activity as it is a mindset, and what that mindset does is it, it sparks innovation, it sparks creativity, it has us think of better and different ways of doing things. I mean, I have been in meetings where we've been trying to solve problems and we've been trying to come up with solutions, and when that is, is treated with a sense of play and energy and happiness, People are really enjoying it. The problem becomes like a puzzle, and how do we fix this, and how do we solve this? And people become very excited. I've also been in meetings where you know, you're talking about solving something, everybody's in a terrible, horrible mood, everyone's blaming each other, everybody's getting defensive, and it's, it's a very, very negative experience. And that difference between those two is having that attitude of being playful, lightheartedness, and, and enjoying your work. So if there's a solution that needs to be found in a place that you work in and you're, you love working there, you're going to find it. And finding that solution brings you joy. Now on our campus, we certainly have a lot of examples of play. 
that we do so outside of our, our everyday work. Uh, for the President's Picnic, which by the way, I've heard a lot of people really enjoy, so we're keeping that every fall. We're gonna do a welcome back picnic for that. So, so it's a lot of fun. Um, it, but also, you know, lots of departments do birthday celebrations, um, Halloween, I mean, in Halloween, some, uh, some areas, do really well, um, and the round building, by the way, threw down the gauntlet and said they do the best Halloween for Margaret. Um, so everyone, Halloween is on for this year. We are anybody who wants to participate, we're going to take it uh, to to the next level. But that creates fun and excitement and cohesion. We have the band books, uh, the band books in the library, where they bring the show just put out a book display, but they have the theater kids involved in sharing that information. Um, apparently, murdering me was a lot of fun um, for people on campus, uh, but it was a great learning experience, and um, there was certainly a great sense of play as an entire thing of blood accidentally, or goo, got, got dumped on me. Um, I was told it was an accident, I'm not sure. Convalados, all of these things are, are things we do on our campus that are sort of celebrations and recognition where we have fun. But, but the idea of play is, is something that, in particular as it relates to service excellence, is something that really is enthusiasm, creativity, innovation every day. So it's not just sort of saving it for these special occasions, but really looking at how you integrate that every day. And one of the nice things about incorporating a sense of play into your workplace is that it often leads to making somebody's day. You know, it, it really can make, it can make somebody's day. I know, um, nor am I encouraging this, but there was a point where Don Luna and um, some others filled my office up with a thousand balloons. Uh, Linda, I still think you gave them the key. But anyway, uh, they filled it up with a thousand. It took me almost a week and a half to get rid of all the balloons, but um, it, it brought me joy every time I looked at it, and then also plot and revenge. But, uh, <laughs> but, but that, that kind of opportunity can create a sense of fun at work. But when it comes to making their day, I often have mixed feelings about this because when I make somebody's day, when I do something that makes them happy, I almost feel a little bit guilty because it makes me feel so good to make someone else uh, have a, to do something special for someone else. But when you are demonstrating all those different things I listed earlier about service excellence, you know, if you are someone who follows up and solves somebody else's problem, who is friendly and warm, just by demonstrating those behaviors, you often make somebody's day. How often have you been somewhere where someone genuinely looks at you and says, how are you doing today? How's everything going? And they have a, a sincere, genuine conversation with you. That may be all it takes to make somebody's day. Sometimes we do a little bit more, but really just engaging in service excellence is often all that it takes. Um, I, I can give you an example. Just yesterday, I told Peggy I was putting this in here, I was so impressed, Peggy brought me celery. Now, that may seem like a, a small thing, but I went, I, I'm trying to be on a diet, it's horrible. And um, I went on a quest for celery the day before. There was no celery to be found anywhere on this campus, and I ate lettuce instead. It is not as good as celery. I'm just going to put it out there. So the next day, she put some celery on my desk, and I was very, very happy. But it was, it was so thoughtful because she recognized that trying to stick this diet, she was being helpful. Um, and, and we do appreciate that almost every day someone brings sweets to the office. That's not very helpful for our dieting, but it also is very, it's very nice. But there's other things like thank you cards or thank you email. Just taking a moment to say to someone, hey, thank you for doing this for me. Showing that level of appreciation. It doesn't have to be long, but just that thoughtfulness means a lot. Or I just was invited, uh, the Connor Bleacher Institute does a, a thing every year where um, where Rizzo makes the best brisket I've ever had ever in my life. I'm figuring out a way to share it with you all. It is that good. But um, everyone was so excited and so appreciative and it really made their day, probably the entire week leading up to it because it was so fantastic. I thought he was just bragging, but really it is the best brisket anywhere. Um, these kinds of things though, these opportunities, these small things make a huge difference to make people feel like you know, you're making their day. But the thing that can make someone's day more than anything else, and particularly when we think about our students, is helping them solve a problem, helping them get through something. And when you help a student, you take that time, you work with them, you help them find a solution to a problem, you follow through, you don't just send them off somewhere, you really listen to what they need and you help them, and you watch that fear anxiety go off their face, and you know you've made a difference with that student, you have made their day, but for me, it makes my day as well. And so, you know, I really, if that is not something you do as a standard practice, you want to make sure you do it. Another great thing about these simple acts I was just talking about that we can do, these behaviors, it also really lends itself to being there, what they talked about being there. I know Amy Alder Stanford gave a presentation earlier today talking about communication and how if you're talking to someone but you're looking over their shoulder at what's coming next, you know, that's not 
uh, that is not being there for the person. And it's hard. Cell phones are, are going off all the time. Sometimes I forget to turn my computer off and hear the dinging of the emails coming in. You're in a meeting and you're just thinking about all the work that you have to do. Or many of you that deal with students, um, you're, you know, especially in the round building, you're working with a student and you're seeing the line forming um, behind that person. It's hard. But if you can focus on being there for each other and for students and really listen, what is the problem? What is the concern? What is the thing that I can do to help this person? and then go about helping to solve that, it will make all the difference in the world. If you are not focused in and you're not really there in that conversation, you're never really truly gonna be able to help the person. You're not gonna be able to give the information they need. You're not going to notice that I just had five students with the same problem. Or I just had five faculty or staff members call this office and they all have a similar issue. You know what, I really need to be proactive and figure out how to solve that. Because it's not just one person, now it's, it's a group. What can I do? So being there becomes really, really important um, in that interaction. And another piece of it that's really important is being knowledgeable and knowing your job well so that you can help, but also knowing where you can find other resources. You don't ever want to say, you know what, that's not my department, figure it out somewhere else. You, if someone is there with you, you want to at least try to help them find the next place. Call ahead, find that place that they need so they can get the help that, that's really there for them. And then finally, choose your attitude. Um, and this is, I think, um, I don't, please don't come to work on two hours sleep. But um, um, besides that, a piece of it, choosing your attitude is really important. And one of the things you have to ask yourself is, how would my colleagues describe me? If you work with students, how would students describe me? Because we might think we have a great attitude, um, but if other people don't think you have a great attitude, you do not, okay? So there is that piece of it. Other people are your reflection of your attitude, you know? So that is, that is really important. You need to pay attention to other people's uh, interpretation of it. But having an attitude of service excellence, of, of having high energy, creativity, a passion, that is really incredibly important. Coming in every day thinking, how do I make this place better? How do I make my job better? How do I show appreciation for those that I work with? And you are empowered to do that. Now, you cannot do that by buying gifts with your P-card. Just, uh, just letting you know that, okay? You can't, that's not an option. But, um, or can you do it by having a big party every day? I've learned to think there's a party every day on campus that she arrived. But you can't do that um, and, and not work. This is also about making sure you, you get your job done. But there is an attitude about service excellence that we each have to carry with us. You know, looking at the Seattle fish market, these people became famous because of this. And I probably, if all of you go to Seattle now, you'll want to stop by them, right? Um, they get up at the crack of dawn and shovel ice. It is very gloomy and cold in Seattle. They are dealing with dead fish all day long. And yet, you know, they have this energy and they love their job. We live in gorgeous, sunny South Texas and deal with students who are trying to make their dreams come true. Okay, so we have a much better environment in which to work. And, um, and when you think about those things, really consider that with your attitude. Years ago, many of you may know Danny. He, he's a grounds person, and um, he keeps the he keeps the well. I shouldn't call it the cat alley. He keeps cat alley um, beautiful. And uh, one time he was out there working. It was a really hot day in the summer, and I said to him, Danny, I said, you know, oh, I bet you hate this weather. It was also when the mosquitoes were out. Those of you who are new to Corpus, uh, you haven't seen nothing yet. But the mosquitoes were out, and he said, I'm alive. The sun is shining. I have a job. Everything's good. And I thought, oh, I have the worst attitude in the world. <laughs> I'm a little stupid when I walk from my car into my office. No, it's just ridiculous. Um, so we really have to think about that every day because it really comes down to us as individuals. I know that um, in, in every job I've had, there are parts that I love and parts that I don't love. And it's really about my attitude, and I'm sure it's the same for you. In this job that I have now, everyone wants to come and tell me every problem on campus. Okay, so I spent a lot of my time fielding problems all day long. And I could have a bad attitude about that, but I decided to make sure that I feel grateful that people feel like they can talk to me and they can say, here's what we think is the problem and they think I can solve it. And I feel grateful that I can try and work at it and see what we can do to make this place better. And so, you know, really looking at your situation with a positive attitude, when you have a student that you're having difficulty with, remember, we have 12,000, what is the exact number, Margaret, 236? All right, all right, I was right, 12,236. If you've got five of them that are giving you trouble, that's pretty good. Okay, so that, you know, we have to always look for that with our attitude. So choose to bring your best self to work, 
Try to love what you do, even if you don't love every single part. And truly, if you are in a job that can't bring you joy, then find a different job. Maybe on campus, that would be great. But I tell, I've told my students for 30 years, life is too short. Find something that gives you joy. And if you find yourself in a position where you're not, you don't have joy, there, there's so many things you can do on this campus or in other places. And you want to make sure that you seek those opportunities. Because, because if you are in a place that brings you joy, they say no day is work if you love your job. I don't buy that, okay, it's still work. But it can be a very, it can be a very positive experience. And remember that by choosing your attitude, you are becoming accountable, you're becoming proactive, and you really need to think innovatively. You need an attitude of innovation. Because if we are going to move ourselves out of being a bureaucracy, we have to be innovative. We have to change the way we do things. If you hear the words coming out of your mouth, that's how we've always done this, not service excellence. If you hear yourself saying, that's not my department, that's not my problem, not service excellence might not be your department, but you can help someone figure out where the right place to be. And if you find that someone is right there and there's an urgent situation, you say, sorry, I can't get to that for X weeks, X days, X months, and um, this is really critical to them, you need to, that, that is not service essence. Now, I do realize some people chronically make a problem where they procrastinate up until the last minute. That's different, okay? And we can work on training and, and, and you know, bringing something always as an emergency is not service excellence either. But not caring what your colleagues' deadlines are, not caring what they have to deal with because it makes your job more complicated is not service excellence. On the flip side, if we really put these practices in place for one another um, and we have the attitude of one university, together we can really make a huge difference as to how this place functions and, and how we feel about coming to work. So in the end, um, it is your attitude that will determine whether or not you make somebody's day or whether or not you're there for them. It's your attitude that will determine whether or not we create an environment and, and embrace play, an environment of creativity and innovation, a place where you are filled with energy when you come here, because it truly is up, is up to each and every one of you. I know that uh, there are, you all know, people on this campus that you can contact when you need help. You know, I'll, I'll, she'll hate that I just did this, but I would say Jan Geyer. There's someone on campus that you know, this person will be knowledgeable, they have the answers, they're gonna be helpful no matter how bad I mess this up, they're gonna help me fix it, um, because there are those people. If you are one of those people that others reach out to, thank you, and you are doing an excellent job and help spread that attitude toward others. If you are not one of those people, ask yourself why. What is it that you are doing that, isn't, that you aren't seen as a resource to others? And how can you change that? So that we have a whole campus filled with those types of employees. As I said, in the end, it comes down to you, the individual, your position on campus, your commitment to service excellence. And we are going to come back and revisit this, and I'm going to be working with leadership on campus as to how we actualize it. But for this university to make a meaningful change, it begins and it ends with you. You will be doing a lot to make service excellence a reality, but you know, as much as we can do from a leadership perspective, you are really the people that make the change possible. So together, we can turn this into an energized campus, and some places I know already are, and so we can help that go across the entire university. And in doing so, what we are going to be able to do is truly make a difference in the lives of our students, in their families, in the communities, and in the world. Because working for Texas A&M University Corpus Christi means you change lives every day. And you should always be very proud of that. Thank you.